Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Finger. I'm the director of the New York Eye Cancer Center and a specialist in ocular tumor, orbital disease, and ophthalmic radiation therapy. As chair of the American Joint Committee on Cancer's Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force, I work with Dr. Ankit Singh Tamar, who has taken the lead in our international multi-center registry that has provided statistically significant research that will improve the lives of children with retinoblastoma. Today, I was asked to present a simple video educating viewers on retinoblastoma, what it is, how it is diagnosed and treated in high, middle, and lower resource regions. What are the differences in eye, vision, and life preservation? First, let's discuss what is retinoblastoma. Second, I want to let you know that it is curable. And third, let's ask the question, why doesn't everyone have access to eye, vision, and life-sparing treatment? Well, retinoblastoma is the most common eye cancer in children. It begins inside the eye in a tissue called the retina. The retina is like the film in your ocular camera. As you can see in this poster, children may look like they have a white pupil called leukocoria, a crossed eye called strabismus, or a bulging eye called bophthalmus. By the way, these posters can be downloaded for free from the Eye Cancer Foundation's website, eyecancercure.com. They can be printed and posted for patient and family education. It is important to know that retinoblastoma cancer is curable through early diagnosis and prompt treatment, but unfortunately, it's just not that simple. Why do most children with retinoblastoma die from this cancer? This is because in higher income countries and regions, early diagnosis and advanced medical care provide excellent eye globe and vision salvage rates. For those in middle to lower resource brackets, this is not the case. In countries like Africa and Asia, retinoblastoma cases, including many advanced retinoblastoma tumors, are not ever diagnosed. There are no eye cancer specialists to be had or seen, all resulting in poor outcomes. This month, in Lancet Global Health, a systematic review and meta-analysis by Emily Wong and colleagues provided strong evidence that overall survival, globe salvage, and visual acuity outcomes are compromised due to disparities in socioeconomic and related healthcare factors. It was emphasized that there is a need for targeted healthcare policies and actions to improve retinoblastoma care. So let me ask, why are so many children with retinoblastoma in low resource countries? One reason is that there, there is a incidence of retinoblastoma that is proportional to the size of, of the population and therefore its birth rate. Therefore, in high resource, high income areas, there are lower birth rates like in Japan, the United States, and some European countries. Those countries have more resources and fewer cases, and therefore they can bring those resources to those fewer cases to achieve better outcomes. Just one example, in the United States, there are about 325 new cases or approximately one case per million per year versus 2000 cases in India which is thought to be the country with the highest per capita number of retinoblastoma cases in the world. But it just isn't that simple. Tumor registries are more common in places like Japan, United States, and Europe. It is easier to find out how many cases of retinoblastoma have been occurring in India as compared to parts of Africa but it's not where the incidence of retinoblastoma is likely to be highest, like Africa and Asia. It's almost certain that many of the world's children 
with retinoblastoma are, e are never diagnosed or recorded. The paramount question is, what can be done to reduce or eliminate childhood mortality from retinoblastoma? Let's just think about it. Where do we start? Let's begin with looking at some foundational problems associated with delivering retinoblastoma care in low resource countries. The most common reason for the difference between outcomes in low and high resource countries is delay in diagnosis. This results in children presenting with very advanced and often uncurable deadly cases of retinoblastoma. In their Lancet article, Dr. Wong and colleagues determined that low awareness among parents, financial instability, and scarcity of ophthalmic resources all contributed to delayed recognition of retinoblastomas. Different social customs and different religious beliefs also can delay or obstruct early diagnosis. For example, though curative, when treatment requires loss of an eye, this has different implications for female versus male patients. Some religious beliefs may also delay the delivery of care, which can be disastrous for children with retinoblastoma. Most of the people in Jordan are Muslim, and there's nothing against the nucleation as long as this decision was taken by, by the doctor, except very few people who believe that if they pray enough, the God will cure the eye. The main issue in Jordan is pure social, since the family will be very worried about the future for their kid. Mainly if that was a girl, what would be her chance to get married in the future? What kind of job she will get in the future? For this reason, the family may refuse doing a nucleation and then get back with extraocular invasion and metastasis. The cost of specialized equipment and knowledge to work this equipment is a challenge in lower resource countries. Most of this equipment must be imported and there needs to be technicians and physicians trained to use it. The equipment and medicines need to be used effectively. Even death related to retinoblastoma is different for each region. For individuals in high resource countries, mortality usually occurs from second malignancies rather than the original retinoblastoma. In comparison, most children in lower resource countries will likely die from extraocular extension of their retinoblastoma or systemic spread in that the primary retinoblastoma tumor contained within the eye is treatable and children do receive that treatment in higher resource countries. Research there has focused now on globe preservation and vision salvage techniques. So what do we conclude from this talk? The most important takeaway from this talk is that reducing or even eliminating almost all retinoblastoma deaths across the world is possible using today's technologies. This is because early detection and prompt treatment is typically curative. One question is how do we provide retinoblastoma care when tens of countries don't have education, government support, or even one eye cancer specialist? The Eye Cancer Foundation and the International Council of Ophthalmology have been working together to support fellowship training of retinoblastoma specialists for unserved countries and underserved areas. The Eye Cancer Foundation's 2020 initiative provided fellowship training opportunities around the world for aspirants from unserved and underserved countries. Other nonprofit charitable organizations have similar programs. Our goal is to seed the world with specialists with the awareness and motivation to expand services in these countries and find those children. One exceptional example is Dr. Yaqub Youssef, who returned from fellowship to his native Jordan. He built a regionally, then internationally recognized ophthalmic oncology service at the King Hussein Cancer Center, 
and then paid it forward. He trained eye cancer specialists for unserved and underserved countries around the Middle East. I must add that Dr. Youssef has also recently been awarded the King Hussein Award for Excellence in Cancer Research. Though the Eye Cancer Foundation supported retinoblastoma fellowship education for over 50 specialists, it could not have been done without our worldwide network of affiliated professors on all continents. Though they are all wonderful, and we thank them all, I have to take the time to personally thank one, Dr. Santosh Hanavar, and his center of sight for hosting more fellows than any other center in the world. He has done a wonderful job, and we are very appreciative. Thank you, Santosh. In a separate effort, eye cancer specialists from around the world came together to write an open access cancer surgical textbook to provide free guidance for the world's ophthalmologists and specialists caring for eye cancers. But you may ask, what can I do? The answer is that what is dearly needed is for the entire eye cancer community, patients and doctors, families, to organize social service agencies, to foster synchronized multi-step programs of public awareness, professional training, infant eye screening, and medical economic development. We at the American Joint Committee on Cancer's Ophthalmic Oncology Task Force have been working hard to put together multi-center international cooperation so that we can pool data on this rare tumor. This pooled data is then analyzed, and we have been providing answers to crucial questions to maximize treatment strategies, eliminate waste, and thus guide government policies. The work of Dr. Wong and colleagues showed that retinoblastoma treatment outcomes have improved globally, but further progress requires us to bridge the gap between high resource and low resource countries. Together, we have an opportunity. In fact, we have an obligation to save both life and sight for children with retinoblastoma. This is Dr. Paul Finger. I would like to take a moment to thank those who contributed to this work and to the Eye Cancer Foundation. It is only with their support for research and educational initiatives that we can do so much for so many patients with eye cancer. We want to help you. We want to help your children. We want to help families around the world. Please consider joining us. Start by visiting our website, eyecancercure.com. Thank you. Stay well.